basically what I was ministering on the last, uh, well, it's been weeks, because even one before we left, even though we skipped a whole bunch of weeks. <laughs> it's actually only been three times, but it's been two or three months. Um, you know, somebody was praying this morning about wilderness and the Garden of Eden. I think it was you, Terry. And, you know, they're actually both one and the same. You know, the Garden of Eden is the Garden of Eden to the spirit, but it's a wilderness to the flesh. And to the flesh, or to the spirit, you know, the, the, uh, garden, the Garden of Eden to the flesh is actually a wilderness to the spirit. You see what I'm saying? So, and, I mean, that's the way it always works with the things of the kingdom of God. It's the same tree. It just depends on how you, you look at it or, or what spirit is behind it. Well, it's the same way with the wilderness and the uh, Garden of Eden. You know, we always think about the Garden of Eden, but when we sing the song, I think it's, it's the verse is he's restoring the garden or something. Isn't that the verse? And what you don't realize is that's going to be a wilderness of the flesh. Yeah. You know, the flesh isn't, doesn't really particularly care. I mean, we'll train our flesh to like it, yes. but the flesh naturally gravitates not towards the Garden of Eden. It, it, it doesn't do that. Because, yeah, because that's where the rulership of God is. And uh, that's where there is no flesh allowed, you know, so to speak. There's no gratifying of it. And uh, so it's one and the same. It just depends on which, you know, angle you're coming at it from. And uh, I, there was a scripture I wanted to read um, last week, and it's in Hebrews. And it's, it's a f you know, I've read it a lot of times, but, you know, if you, we get down right down to it, I've read a lot of scriptures a lot of times. You know, if you get into the, if you preach a lot in the New Testament, eventually you're going to cover everything and, and uh, you're going to read pretty much everything. So it's in uh, chapter 11. And I'm going to start in verse 8. It says, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Now, as I read this story, I want you to understand something, is we're reading a natural illustration of what our spirit lives are. We're going to a place where we don't know where we're going. And, and that's, see, that's the, and this is where churches really get messed up. A lot of churches really get messed up is because they're, most of them are trying to call you to a place that you can see. They're trying to call you to a place where you've seen other people go. But this says it called Abraham. He didn't know where he was going. Come on. Come on. And that's difficult, again, for the flesh because we always want to know. Who doesn't want to not know where they're going? When you, you know, most people, when they go on vacation, they want to know where they're going. And, or when you travel somewhere, and when Kathy travels to Des Moines or when you go to Kansas City, whenever you go anywhere, you want to know where you're going. Yeah, you want to know what lane you're to be in. You want, you want to know any traffic. Um, I mean, they've got apps now where you can find uh, where there are uh, any kind of detours or road construction or roads closed. Uh, yeah, speed, tra all of those. You want to know all of that. Yeah, but we're going to a place where we don't know. So right off the bat, right off the bat, your flesh is going to start screaming. You don't even know what direction. Yeah, you don't know what direction because we've never been there. So this whole story that we're reading here is an illustration of what, what, what living by faith really is. You know, it, it, like I said, and I shared last week, you know, so many people want God to navigate their lives, but in the navigation, it, you're after things that you can see. In other words, you know finances exist. You know health exists. You know ministry exists. You've seen it. You know, if you want to purchase a house, houses exist, cars exist. Those are all things that you can see. But the gist of this gospel, although God does that, because we live in this system, the gist of this is to go to a place that you've never seen that you don't know where you're going. And that becomes really difficult for people because what the church wants to do is make it a seen thing because they want people to have vision. I think somebody said that. It might have been Danielle last week. You know, we make that city out there the city that we're going after because that gives people a vision that their flesh can see. 
And see, we're going after a city that the flesh can't see. And I shared last week that they'll never win this city. I said, you know, they always want to win the city out there. They've got the right mandate. They've heard in their spirit we're to win a city. The problem is they're trying to win that city instead of this city. And, well, this city is in here. So it becomes, uh, it becomes a real trap when we start to use the things of the flesh to give people vision. It said, By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. Now how does that uh, apply to us? What happens when you go to a foreign country? You don't know the language. But there's, 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 foreign lang- there's foreign countries he could go to and he doesn't know the language. Yeah. We, we, can't we can't talk in his language. So you're already, so you're already learning that you and I are going to have a language come on, come on. that this system does not understand. Come on, that's good. Our mannerisms. You know there's a lot of foreign countries you go to. Do you know that ma- some American mannerisms are very offensive? Yeah. Some of the phrases that we say, and that it's not a big deal. I mean, in our culture, it's common. But you go to a foreign country, and it now becomes very offensive. Now, what we wear, what we eat, how we eat. See, the, the, God, the writer of Hebrews here, God, the Holy Spirit, is using an illustration to give us what our spiritual life is going to be like. See, so we're in a foreign land, so people are not going to understand our language. They don't understand what we say. They don't understand our mannerisms. They don't understand the, the quote, Christian culture, because the Christian culture is, is a foreign, it's a foreign nation within this system. This world system doesn't understand it. That's why many times people don't understand why we do the things that we do. Is because it's a foreign language and they don't understand. Now, what is it? What, let's continue. What does it say then? <clears throat> he lived in tents. That's Christian life. You're to live in a temporary dwelling. You say, well, what do you mean? What does it mean to live in a temporary dwelling? That means that we're a constantly on the move, on the change life. How many of you ever known Christians, you, you, you went to church with them years ago, and then you come and you meet them, and they're still where they were 30 years ago. They've made a permanent dwelling where they're at. They're not living in tents. This is a life about tent living. You pick up and you go constantly. It's a constant life of change. And that's, again, uncomfortable the flesh. Everything I'm giving here is, is denying yourself. Everything. I mean, think about it. When Abraham had to live in a tent, we always get stuck on all the blessings that he had and all the cattle that he had and all this. You know, he had to move all that junk everywhere. Every time they moved, they had to pull everything down, move it all, and put it all back up. That would get to be a real irritant. And I've, I've used this illustration before. Those of you that have ever moved, if you've ever moved somebody that's been in a permanent dwelling, what are the, what's the one thing they want to do? Take everything. Don't you wish they could figure that out in Christianity? They want to down, so they want to get rid of a bunch of the stuff that they've been accumulating all these years but a lot of times they won't do it. They want to hire a big moving van and they want to take all their junk with them. And how, tell me, have anybody had, has anybody ever had to move somebody that's, that's been there and accumulated a whole lifetime's worth of stuff? Yes. How much fun is it? It is, and it's horrible work. <laughs> and it takes, a, it takes a special person to downsize and get rid of stuff. You know why? Because people become, listen, Think spiritually. They get so attached to their junk that has no value to it other than reminiscing and memories. (laughs) 
So this hits home because this week God told me it's time to purge some stuff. And when you're purging, it's like you don't want to throw it away because you might use it you again. You might. That's exactly and, if we don't, and we all want God to do something new, but we don't want to get to the old because we might want to use it again. That's right. That's it. There you go. I was just going to, I was just going to say that. Thank you. Because... That's exactly what people do, is they want to hang on. I've seen so many people hang on to stuff because they think that someday they're going to use it. And I'm sitting here thinking, I'm not them. I know they're not going to use it. I know they're not. Yeah, a lot of people keep broken stuff. I mean, it's, it's, you want everything, uh, everything in the natural lines up with what I'm sharing with you in the spiritual. Is we want to hang on to that stuff because someday we think we might want to use it. And I'm a person who, I look at stuff, and I know Kathy may not know this, but there's a lot of stuff I throw away. She'll dig it out of the trash. <laughs> we can sell it. We'll put it in a garage sale. I want to get rid of it. Because it's taking up space. And uh, we have to understand that that's going to be the Christian life. Is God wants us to dump stuff that every time we pick up and move our tent somewhere, we're going to be shedding stuff. We're going to be shedding some things. And people make such a big deal out of all the stuff that Abraham had. That had to be a pain in the you-know-what to try to move constantly all the time because they sojourned their whole life. They, they never lived in a, in a permanent dwelling. And that's where the Christian is supposed to be. So when you meet somebody that's been still where they're at 30 years, they're not in real Christianity. They're not in faith. See, we're reading. It says by faith. It takes faith to change and, and to move, to constantly pick up when God is moving. And we're not talking about financial blessings or healings or things like that. Look, I'm not, I'm not against those things. You know that. I preach those things. We love God to navigate our lives. We love healing. We love God to direct us what house to buy, what car to buy, what business decision to make. We love God to do that. But that's not what Abraham was searching for. That God added unto him. He wasn't searching for the stuff. That was added to him. Remember what we shared last week? Seek first what? Which is what? What is the kingdom of God? It's His rule in our life and what? His righteousness and what? All those things will be added unto you. And so we make the, we make the faith message about Abraham obtaining all this stuff. And that was never it. That was added to him. His faith was he was looking for a city whose maker and builder was God. And then that got added to him. Yeah, go ahead. So in Corinthians, it talks about us being an ambassador for Christ, and mm -hmm. what that is is it is a it's a diplomat. It says it's sent by a country as its official representative to a foreign country, and that's what we're supposed to be doing. Is that People think that being an ambassador is just taking your way of religion and giving it to someone else that doesn't have it, and that's not true. We're supposed to be the go-between of this present age and the next one. And as we grasp that, no matter where we are or what we're doing, we still have the same language, the same city within us, so that when someone comes to us that doesn't know the language and doesn't understand mm -hmm. where they're going, we can point them in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It says he lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs of, with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, who architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers 
on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. I just want to stop there for a minute. Notice what it says, people who say such things. You have to understand what the writer of Hebrews is speaking there because when he uses the word say, he's not talking about mouth. He's talking about their actions are speaking because if you go back up and read, well, I'm going to go, I'm even going to go read that. If you just go back up here to verse 4, it says, By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. Well, how can Abel still speak? It's because his actions are still speaking. So when it says those who say such things, those aren't people who just go to church and say the right words and sing the right songs. These are actions that are speaking to the spirit realm. Our actions are what speak, not our words. I mean, you we can say, for instance, you've got, you know, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And we understand that scripture, and I believe that scripture, or life and death. I don't know. Which one comes first? Is life and death? Is, in, huh? Is life and death? I always get it. I always turn it around for some reason. I guess that's how I see things. Uh, but life and death are in the power of the tongue. But what does he really mean by that? It doesn't just mean that you're speaking the right words, because I know many people who speak the right words but have no actions to back it up. And James, the book of James, uh, shows that. It says, you say you have faith, but you have no works. And we always think that, that life and death are in the power of the tongue, and we think people who are whiners and complainers are always saying you know, negative things. I agree with that. But then you've also got the people who are saying the right things but don't have any actions to back it up. That's still death. Not only is it death, but it's also deceiving. At least the people that are saying the wrong things, you know they're wrong. So we have to look and we have to expand that scripture to include people who just talk the right talk and speak the right language. Because he said, those who say such things, in other words, those who make actions show that they're looking for another country. You lay down a fence. You are showing, you are speaking, I'm looking for another country. The scripture says, whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes, him, makes himself an enemy of God. Now, what does being a friend of the world mean? <clears throat> Living by what? In living by its culture and by its ways. So when we yield to offense, we're being a friend of the world. When we yield to outbursts of wrath, we're being a friend of the world. Contentions, a friend of the world. Lust, a friend of the world. What's the other ones? Uh, heresies, friend, a friend of the world. You make yourself an enemy of God. And that's why it's so difficult when I go in and preach to churches, you know what we've done? Is we've made these scriptures a friend of the world. Because when we preach that this is only to navigate your life in this, in, this, in this system, when we preach it's all about you're getting your ministry or you're getting holiness so that you can minister or so that you can know what God has called you to do, look, we want all those things. So that if you're spending all your time in prayers to what house to buy, what car to buy, where to live, you know, what city to live in, about your ministry and all of that, you've already made the scriptures a friend of the world. Because then I'll come in and I'll preach righteousness and rulership and you, I've seen it happen. And I watch people get angry. Why? Because now God has become their enemy. Many of you had to go through the gauntlet. When you came in here, you were a friend of the world. Now you like what I preach. Now you like the things of the kingdom of God. You want to hear the rulership. You want to hear the righteousness and what we're supposed to be walking in. But we had some arguments with some of you. going <laughs> what and some have left because they made for themselves an enemy of what God was really intending to do 
And uh, this is one of the reasons, uh, you know, that Jesus never preached on those things. He preached on the rulership, the kingdom of God, and he demonstrated the navigation. And we want the navigation, obviously. We want God to speak to us going through life so that we make the right decisions. But we want him, why, do we want him, why do we want God to speak to us to make the right decisions? We discussed this Wednesday night. So that we can just have a hunky-dory life? No. It's because we love him. And because when you make the right decision, you're speaking to the demonic realm as well as the kingdom of God realm, as well as this scene realm. You're saying such things that you're looking for another country, another ruler. You got something? I, I said, we preach the rulership, and we demonstrate the rulership too, but we demonstrate the navigation. I mean, we demonstrate the rulership, we demonstrate the righteousness, which is also navigation. Rulership is navigation. But we've chosen, we've picked and chosen what navigation we want. We, like I say, we want him to navigate this life, but not this life. And we want to go after this life first, and then the navigation of this life will be added unto us. We're just out of order. I'm not saying any of those things are wrong. We're always out of order. Because that's what the devil does. If he can get it out of order, I learned this from Randy Shankle a long time ago. If he can get it out of order, it's messed up. He's got you. I was thinking uh, some of the things we've discussed here in the last few weeks... This is why one of the reasons that so many, and think of how many people on the earth, we talked about World War I last week, or I, I just mentioned it, but how many people on the earth have tried to bring peace upon the earth? How many people have fought? There have been, there have been certain people that have, that have raised up, that have said a particular message, and do you know why that is? is because Paul wrote about this in Romans chapter 7. You're familiar with it, where he said, the things that I want to do, I don't do. The things that I want to do, I don't do. The things that I don't want to do, I do. He said, because when I thought, when the, when the word came, don't covet, it would be easy for me to say, don't covet. And I wouldn't covet. But he said, I, he said, I found another law inside of me called the law of what? Sin and death. And he said, so when the law came, it stirred my members to do what I was told not to do. So as we have people raise up and try to bring peace on the earth without obtaining this city, what are they actually doing? They're stirring up violence. If you tell people that to, to demonstrate peacefully... if and it's not from this city, it's not from the anointing of God, it stirs them up to do violence. Isn't that what's happening? Yes. <laughs> you see this all the time. Have you heard people tell you not to do drugs? How long have we had that going on? How long have we had don't do drugs? I told you guys you know, you here years past, months past. Well, I can remember in the sixth grade, six, 12 years old, I'm 67 now. And all they kept saying, we just need more sex education and more drug education, and that'll take care of this epidemic. How's that worked out? It's gotten worse because when you say don't, people, the flesh wants to do. It takes the anointing to break the yoke. Without the anointing, you'll never break the yoke. You stir the yoke. You stir people's members to do what it is you're telling them not to do. And this is what happened is we have changed the, the message to navigation. So when all the messages of don't get offended come out, all the messages of don't get angry come, come out, and all the messages of don't, uh, uh, contentions and jealousies and all the, all, when all of those teachings comes out, what's actually happening? You're stirring people up to do them.
That's the virus that I talked about last week. It's the virus that's in there because it's causing people to become, because people just they go off the handle in anything. And that's being loosed on the earth, and that's why the earth is going off the handle at anything. God, I wish we could raise, you know, it's to the point now, and I hate to say this because I, I, I'd really love to see real healings and real miracles, but it's to the point now I'd just like to find a group of people that don't get offended or angry. Boy, could we find that? What would we have? What would that do to the earth? What would that loose on the earth? Man, that's never been seen. That's a tent. It might start affecting the world. I mean, I don't think we're going to, I don't know. You know this? Just think about this. What if when the church reaches where it's supposed to reach, it actually changes the world into what the church is? And everything is changed in the twinkling of an eye, including the unbeliever. Because of what we've loosed on the earth. I mean, we see what we've loosed on the earth so far and what it's done. What if we loosed, if we, if we actually got victory over all these works of the flesh, and we could actually speak to people, we could actually, in, in the church, I'm talking about church, if we, there was an actual church where we could tell people certain things, you know, change the music around or say we want this song here or we want that song there or we could or or our belief system or whatever it is and people absolutely wouldn't get offended or get mad wouldn't get that you know what i mean by offended you know when people go the stiffening if they wouldn't get stiff i wonder what that would bring on the earth Because we've seen what we've lived on the earth before. And if we've affected the earth as much as I think we have with that stuff, I wonder if we actually got the righteousness of God loosed in us and ruling in us, what would that do to the earth? Yeah, she's going to be. Sorry, hon. Kind of like when you are, as a person in your family, like I know that I have gone through deliverance and broken things in my life, and I know that what is done is is empowered and made that available for my kids now to walk in that freedom. Ultimately, it's their choice, Mm -hmm. but it's like because I have broken these things that it has empowered them and made it available for them, like there's a grace available. And like what you're saying, I feel like when we start really walking in this, we, I mean, it's ultimately people's choice in the world, yeah. but the thing is, is that we, what we are doing then is we are empowering them to make that choice, and it's like we are releasing that grace that makes it so available, you know, to them. Yeah, let's see, that's a good illustration. Think about, think about how the church has loosed the evil stuff on the earth. Usually, everybody doesn't grab it. You know, you know what I mean? Some people grab onto it, and they're much worse than other people, right? But eventually, those, those people that grab it and are really affluent in it start affecting the ones that aren't choosing. Do you know what I mean? Are you, are you following me? On, is, are, huh? Yeah, you, you see it on, you see, we're seeing it. You know, people will grab the evil that we've loosed, you know, the, the adultery, the fornication, all the different things that we have had, the rage, the offense, and people carry it to extremes. You know, most people are not going to shoot people over road rage, but you know they're starting to do that now. Most kids are not going to shoot people in their classrooms, but we're seeing that now, right? That wasn't happening when we were in school. That never, none of that stuff, you, nobody shot people because you had a fender bender. Nobody brought a gun to school and shot. All right, see, so some people are grabbing it, but what's happening is they are affecting the people who aren't doing it yet. And that's why it's, we call it an increase. Now, if the church was to loose the actual works of the Spirit, some people would grab it. But it would slowly start to affect those people who aren't making the choice. That's what would happen.
So Paul writes that, and that's why so many people who have preached peace over the years, all they've done is lose war. It, they've got the right mandate. They've got the right concept. They've seen what the earth is supposed to be. But they do it by flesh. And without the anointing, all you're going to do, and that's what Paul writes about. You can read about it in chapter 7. All you're going to do is stir people to do just the opposite of what you're telling them to do. That's what you're going to do. And people have tried to do that and tried to do that. And it's really sad because they, they had a gift from God. It's just like the people who are trying to win their city out there. I believe in winning the city. But if you try to win the city the wrong way, what are you actually going to do? You're going to push the city away. Watch. You, can't, you cannot defeat spiritual law. That's the way that it is. And, with that, and that's why I said, and that's why I said it says it, the anointing is what breaks the yoke. So we need the anointing of God. We need the anointed message of God. We need the right message of God, which is His rulership and His righteousness being manifested in us in order to defeat that law of sin and death. But I mean, that's what Paul says. Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? Who's going to deliver me from this thing? Who's going to deliver me from wanting to do just the opposite of what I know I'm supposed to do? Who does he say? He He who? Jesus. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be fighting for righteousness. And I know we're, 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 we have kind of geared ourselves going this direction. But I want to gear us more towards going this direction. I mean, I'm, you know, let me read something to you here. This is in the book of Acts. I haven't been there in a long time. The book of Acts... It's chapter, uh, the last chapter, just about the last set of scriptures, <clears throat> 28. Now, from what I have heard others teach is that the chapters in Acts kind of correlate with how many years past the uh, resurrection. So if we read chapter 6, it's been about 6 years. So we're 28 years. If this is true... And let's just say for this morning that it is. We're 28 years past the resurrection. Now, if we go into when Paul was converted, he was, he was converted in chapter 9. So he's been roughly what we would call saved, born again, for 20 years. Okay? <clears throat> so let's start in verse 23. Last chapter, 28. Verse 23. So when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified of what? Of and the kingdom of God is what? His rulership. his rulership. The kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. Now notice, <laughs> that was a long sermon, wasn't it? From morning till evening, and notice he's still in the prophets and the law of Moses. You and I got the New Testament. He's still, 20 years later, in the law and the prophets. And some were persuaded by the things which were spoken, and some disbelieved. So when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had said one word. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers, saying, Go to this people and say, Hearing you, you will hear and shall not understand. And seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. Now I just want to stop there for a minute. I want you to notice I'm almost the last sermon in the book of Acts is a negative sermon. He's not giving them this big flowery word about how much God loves them and how much they're going to have this big ministry and everything. What, the very last, you'd think he'd leave you on an up note. It does say that he'll go to the Gentiles and the Gentiles are here. But I want you to notice something. He's still preaching the same message out of the same books. You know, something I shared with Kathy here, and I'm, I may have shared this before I went on vacation, is 
Everybody in America and probably the world is always looking for an experience. That's why they try sex every kind of different way. Got sex on the internet, got sex in the internet, got sex by the internet and for the internet. And we've got drug use and all kind of different drugs that they're trying to come out with. And even prescription drugs that are uh, uh, for people for pain, people will get hooked on them and then and they'll want that. They just, they got to have that thing because they're always looking for an experience. And again, this is where the church messes up. Does God give you an experience? Absolutely. But that experience is what? It's to point the way to something else. And we make churches, we continue to have experiences and we continue to make that the theme. The experiences, that's the same, basically the same thing as navigation. But now we're going to throw some miracles and some, quote, what we call supernatural stuff into it. And that's why churches are constantly changing their front ends, their colors and everything, is because they want to give their people constantly new experiences because that's what they're after. You want a new experience? Don't get offended. You want a new experience? Don't get angry. Don't have a contention or a jealousy. You want a new experience? Try that. Just one little problem. You have to deny your flesh to do it. And that's why Jesus came. He came to empower us to deny ourselves the experience of gratifying ourselves. We talked on Wednesday night. Kathy said this is something I needed to share. Is that, and Look at how many people are sleeping around. Why? They're looking for an experience. They're looking for something to fulfill themselves with. Why? They're trying to gratify their flesh, aren't they? I mean, if people now just they, they call it hooking up. They just for recreation, just to do it. They hook up just to have sex so they can have, so they can each feel. Of course, every per, you know everybody's out for themselves. Every time we get offended, we're having another lover. You know, the scripture says all through the Old Testament calls these people harlot, adulterers, ad adulteresses. Remember when it says whoever wants to be a friend of the world is an enemy. He said you adulterers and you adulteresses. What was, he, why was, what was he referring to that? It's not just the stuff of the world. It's the attitudes of the world. You get your attitude straight and the stuff of the world will fall into line. I'll guarantee it. You fight for the righteousness of God and get the righteousness of God and you won't have to worry about the stuff of the world. It'll be added unto you and it'll never become an idol if you continue to go after His rule and His righteousness. It will never become idolatrous. It becomes idolatrous because we switch over and, we, and somewhere there's a line that gets crossed and we start going after that instead of the rule and the righteousness of God. And now all of a sudden... God's now become our enemy. I can't preach righteousness to people. They get angry. They get upset. They get their toes stepped on because they've, somewhere they've crossed the line. Every time we have an outburst of wrath or a jealousy or a competition or a, or a you know, the minute you get stiff, you say, Why you, what, what is that? You're gratifying. Your flesh wants to do that. Your flesh loves getting offended. When something comes to you that you don't agree with or, 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 or that, that is a seemingly a derogatory remark or, or an innuendo that you can't hear God or that, you can't, or that you're less spiritual than some, immediately we fall into bed with another lover. Sleeping with the enemy. We immediately fall into that because we're looking to gratify our flesh. That's why they're doing it. What causes them to do it? Do you think life is tough? Yeah. What we call life in this system, it's not really life. I'm just using that as, because that way people can understand. But the life we have in this system is a hard, tough life. I mean, how many of you, your bosses just treat you like you're the king of the world? Let me see your hand. Nobody? Nobody? You come home, you, you go to work, you get, they put you on a time schedule, they yell at you, they want more out of you and more out of you and more out of you. So when you get off work, <clears throat> I mean, how many, how many people hold arguments against people that aren't even there? 
in your head or even out loud. You talk out loud in your car about, you know, you're arguing with somebody. So you're already sleeping around. You're sleeping with the enemy. Because what are you doing? You're gratifying yourself with your own argument. You're gratifying your flesh. Now, a lot of people, they'll go out and they'll get drunk. They'll go out and they'll go have sex with somebody. They'll go out and they'll do drugs. They'll go out and they'll try to find some way to alleviate the pain of this life by gratifying their flesh. And God has empowered us to deny our flesh. That's why it's so difficult to get people into real Christianity. Because they will not. It's so difficult to get people to deny, deny their flesh. And they've, you've been empowered to do it. It's all of our, like she said, it's all because of our love for him. Let's find out what we've been missing. Let's find out what we've been missing. We've tried it the other way. How's that worked out? But people are just looking for a temporary fix in their flesh. And that's why we get upset. And that's why we get angry. And you see, this is why, um, and this is one of the reasons that God was so angry at the prophets in the Old Testament was because they kept telling people God was going to navigate their life instead of telling them to fight for the righteousness and the rule of God. They kept saying, peace, peace. They kept saying, no evil is going to befall you. Nothing's going to come near you. No harm is going to come to you. They kept saying that. And that's what I see pastors doing today. We've got every evil befalling us, and we've got plagues coming near us like crazy. We, I, I can name off a bunch of ministers that have died from COVID, and you're going to sit there and tell me, no plague will come near us? Doy, 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 come on. We're all in this, but we all need to come out. We need to come out of her and find out what the real righteousness of God is. I mean, I'm a, I want to fight for this thing, man. I want to fight for righteousness. I want to look for that city. And I want to live by faith. I want to live in a tent where I'm constantly on the move. And I can't become familiar with anything. I mean, how many people really here would like to move every six months? <laughs> Why? Uh, uh, what? It's to say all of that, and I want you, if she, if she says this, listen spiritually. Go ahead. The question is, is how many of you want to move every six months? And everybody, everybody here shook their head no. no. Tell me why. It's too much work. Too much work. And there's too much crap to go through. There's too much crap to go through. And it does. It costs a it costs lot. It costs a lot. In energy, in money, your strength, your mental capacities, it's very wearing. Yeah. Christianity 101. But God's empowered us not to be wearying. It's wearying because we're trying to move and take all our stuff with us. Yeah. And he says that we're to go from glory to glory, faith to faith, which faith is hearing God's voice right. and being obedient. Right. So that's why you're saying the tent we change is we're to move with this spirit right. constantly. Constantly. Hearing him better as time yeah. in that sense of, okay, I know what you're saying now, God. And we move and be obedient to what he's saying. And that's moving into more of his goodness, his glory taking over like you taught one time. We're going toward it and it's coming toward us mm -hmm. where Moses and all them it was going behind them yeah you see what I'm saying? and it's a moving towards righteousness mm -hmm. not just a moving of all our stuff it's a moving of in other words we should be able to look at our life and see where our buttons used to be pushed that when they're pushed we no longer act and react the same way now you know you're living in a tent but we don't want to level out and stay at that place because now we've made a permanent dwelling and the stuff's going to start piling up.
Well, I was just going to say, think about what it would be like if you moved to a new place and you got to go buy everything new. The first I was going to say that would be better, but that's tough too. Yeah. That, and that's why it's hard for us to do it because if we move into new places in the spirit, mm -hmm. The new house is different. It takes different furniture. You want to find the right thing that fits in the right place. So it's just as tough doing it that way. I mean, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So this is, it's a tough road no matter what. Yeah. It's a tough road if you stay in the old and try to live in this system. Yep. And it's not going to, it's going to cost you everything to move into the new system too. Sure. So, you know, we always want to take the easy way out. There is no easy way out. But we might as well be doing it God's way. That's right. <laughs> We want to take the old wine with us. Yeah. We don't want the new. Jesus said that. You know, we don't want to take. We want the old wine to follow us along, and we want to try to drag that wine cellar with us yeah. instead of getting the new. Because we immediately say the what is better? The old is better. The old is better. All of these things line up with what I'm trying to minister this morning. Is we're going after another city. Let's win this city that's in here that Abraham was looking for. You can read about it in Revelation. And then let's see what happens to this city here. Then we'll see what happens. Yeah, uh, what I'm getting is uh, what Pastor Kathy said, that uh, if you're living by faith, uh, we should be willing to, uh, to drop some of the things as we move mm -hmm. because the faith of the Lord, listening to God's voice, mm -hmm. might tell you that probably if you leave this year, probably you want to only move with a mattress and probably you're going to be hosted by someone uh, where you're going to go tomorrow. And so every day it's going to be uh, God guiding you to go uh, where he wants you to go. And I read here from the book of James, and it says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into mm -hmm. such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit, yet do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogancy. All your such boasting is evil. Mm -hmm. yep. Absolutely. You know, I know people on the Internet, on these forums that I'm on, that won't move because they have so much stuff. It's become too difficult for them to move, and they don't want to move like they want to get out of California because of, you know, the political system. They say they got too much stuff. They don't want to do that. They want to keep all that stuff. And, so they, and they don't want to get rid of it, and they, and they don't want to move. So they're going to put up, I think spiritually, they're going to put up with crud to stay in that place. That's what people do. Wait, go ahead. You're thinking. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. A couple things. Um, when you said this is Christianity 101, this just shows. I mean, this just shows how out of order we are. Because what the things that you're talking about, mm -hmm. this should be Christianity 101. I mean, mm -hmm. this should be the thing that sets the course. Right. Absolutely. For where we're going, what we're doing, right. you know, across the whole church. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I was thinking about, you know, being out of order, like my my car, you have to put your foot on the brake first and then push the button and then it yeah. starts. Yeah. But if I were to push the button and then put my foot on the brake, it's not going to start. Right. There's nothing wrong with the car. Right. There's nothing wrong with the real message. There's right. nothing wrong with the kingdom. Right. It's out of order. Out of order. You know, and then I was thinking about where, um, you know, a lot of, most people, when you talk about him being king, God being king, and, you know, the rulership and stuff like that, they're like, yeah, but on the inside, they're like, mm, because everybody pretty much wants to do their own thing, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're talking about how the world is looking for something. When you think about it, it says the, 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 the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And so it's like people are looking. They want to be right, okay? They think they, they want everyone else to do their right way of doing things, okay? Everyone, 
every tormented heart, every tormented mind is looking for peace. People who are depressed, sad, you know, don't have any, you know, just don't have any future for their life, looking for joy, right? We have that. It says, it's like if we will seek first the kingdom, mm-hmm. and the kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy. It's in the Holy Spirit. So if we will do it his way, we will get that, mm-hmm. what, the, what everyone's looking for. Even yeah. what the people in the church are looking for is say that they know what it is, but it's his, it's his right way of doing things. It's his peace, and it's his joy. And it's like instead of looking at someone telling me what to do, bossing me around, you know, I really, because people don't want a king. They really don't. Mm-hmm. And I mean, most of the church doesn't want a king. Right. But, but this is what he says. His kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy. Right. Like what we are searching for our whole lives is found in his leadership right. and his rulership. Yep. When he is king, what we've been scratching and fighting for and manipulating for our whole lives right. is found in that. Yep. And notice what it says. It says righteousness comes first. Without righteousness, there's no peace and joy. This is all backwards. Yeah. And see, that's why I brought up the, the people who had the right mandate, they tried to bring it out of order. So it fails. If you're out of order, it fails. It won't work. In fact, if you find most of the people who preached peace when they were in the cities they were in, there was violence when they were preaching it riots because they because it loosed what the very opposite of what they had they had the right mandate but it was out of order you know it was it was it was through the flesh instead of through the order of the spirit you see what i mean okay go ahead for me again just one word came to my mind that we've been talking here and that is the word enough and then the word what? Enough. Enough? Yes. When do we reach that point? Do we fill 20 barns? Yeah. Or do we just fill one wineskin and that's enough? Mm-hmm. You know, and, you know, all too often we never have enough in this world. If we're of this world, we don't have enough. We keep looking for something more, something new, something to happen again. Like you were speaking, a new experience. Something new. Well, quite often I think of the <laughs> the old vehicles I use and how there's times when if I sit down in a brand new vehicle, I think, oh, wow. The smell of this vehicle is just fantastic. I'd love, oh, I don't need it. <laughs> but enough is the word for me quite often. Mm-hmm. When have I hit that point? I think quite often as I, every once in a while, I watch TV. And just recently I watched a show that brought up these people that, uh, I think they were called Roma or something like that. Yeah. They're a... Mm-hmm sort of a gypsy type people that used to travel around uh, like in Italy and so forth and they had one wagon and a horse but that was enough Mm -hmm. you know well Abraham he had a tent that was enough I think of God did he ever ask for a house to live in and desire it God didn't ask didn't require mm-hmm. a place mm-hmm. to be in. He said, you know, I, I don't think there's a quota, but, but he, he was always happy to be a traveling person. He wanted not to be stuck in one place. And one, one final thing, and that is when I think of wine, and you know I make wine, and I think the old wine skin and the new wine skin, Well, often we think that we can set something aside. I think of it a slightly different. I think of that I don't want to just set it aside so I can come back to it. I want to put it to death. I want to put that thing so I can't possibly come back to it. I want to move on, Mm -hmm. and I want to forge forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the neat thing about God is, though, is that we live in a system 
that requires homes. You're not going to live too long without a house in this country during the winter time. <laughs> and you go further north, it gets worse. So God said, all the things that the Gentiles seek after would be added unto me. And these are all the things, that, and, he, yeah, and he knows that we have need of them, if we really have a need of them. Um, let's see, I had a thought and it just left. I was thinking of uh, my old scout. How many of you remember the scout? <laughs> it was a real old vehicle, and it had it had rusted in a lot of places. It's like a SUV, like a Bronco or a Blazer or something. And Chuck, when he rode in the back, he said, "I never saw it snow inside a car before because." the wheels would throw snow up and it would hit you it would, like it was snowing in the car. And you could see the highway through the, through the holes and everything as you went down. Now, to get from here to church, yeah, that's probably all I need. But to travel someplace to any distance, I wouldn't trust it as far as I could throw this building. You know? So I needed something newer and better to get to the places that we go. And some of you, I know, like you have a business. You're not, the scout's not going to handle it. You're not going to be able to pull any trailer or anything or popcorn with a scout. You're not, you don't want to do that. That's be a no-no. OSHA would probably shut the thing down if you hold any food in it because it would be covered with dust. I mean, the thing would just fill with dust when you went to the, you had to, it didn't have an air conditioner. You had to turn the heater on full blast to try to keep the dust out. That's always nice in the summertime. Yeah, so, so God, God knows what we have need of, and he will provide, and all those things will be added unto it. It's when those things start to take precedence over the righteousness of God, that's where it becomes now it's your enemy. And it's creating pro, uh, idolatries and all those works of the flesh. And I've just seen this in Christianity. If you watch and read all the books, listen, read the titles on the books, l listen to a lot of messages, the hidden message is in there that this is still about God navigating our lifestyle. Yeah, it's, that, that's what it does. It makes it, we, we, this, is how it's, this is how deception is, is we keep saying it's all about God directing you. It, it's, it's God, so it's like we're still, it's, it, it's like it's His kingdom but it's still all about, all about you. That's the hit that you don't see. That's what you have to see. And it's in there. And that's what's creating all of these problems. That's what's creating. We're, the law is coming to it. Then we hear somebody once a year will preach on offense. And everybody will amen it and everything. And then they go right out and get offended. Because people are leaving churches. And I mean people that have been there a long time. Over goofy stuff. And it shouldn't be that way. And all you're doing is taking your offense with you. And that thing's going to. It, it, you're, you're moving, taking it with you, because I'm going to need it someday. Yeah. When I get to this new church, I, wanna be, I don't want to get rid of that, because I know that I just might need it someday when Pastor Mike says such and such, and I'm going to pull that thing out, and I'm going to get to use it. Okay, have I made my point? <laughs> okay. All right. Anybody else have anything? When you're talking about it's all supposed to be about God, but we turn it and it's really all about us. And I was thinking the scripture where he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind and all your strength. Mm -hmm. And what happens is, we love ourselves with all of our heart, mm -hmm. with all of our mind, with all of our soul and all of our strength. And then we love God second yeah. or third. Yeah. You know, maybe we love our children second and then God third or fourth mm -hmm. or our job second or third. And mm -hmm. God and we're to love. And, you know, even Jesus reiterated that, you know, love the Lord your God mm -hmm. and not love you, your God. You see what I'm saying? Yep. And that's where we get messed up. We put ourselves in the top place. Mm -hmm. And he says, in all things, he must have.
have preeminence. But see, here, superiority. Yeah, here's the thing. I don't. We're not consciously doing that. No. It's it it it's happens fed to us. It it ha what it's it's fed to it's us. It's fed to us, and, and it we manifest become it without in our even knowing it. We yeah. think we're putting God yeah. first because we're talking about God navigating our life. So it's God well, it's all about Him. Yeah. You know, it's all about Him. But the, the virus is, it's yes. creating inside of us, it's still all about us. Right, because you become what you eat. That's right. Even when you loathe yourself, yeah. you're still loving yourself. Right. Because you're worshiping yourself. Yep. Just, As you're saying that, it's like even when you loathe yourself, you yep. can get on the other side. Right. You're still, it's all about you. So you're actually you. loving yourself right. as you're loathing yourself. Yeah. I was just thinking, too, how many times you've said through the years, Kathy, that people just add God unto their lives. So, that we again, that scripture that we quote all the time, seek ye first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, all these things will be added unto you. We do it backwards. Yeah. We seek all of these things, and then we add God unto that, or yeah. we want God added unto that. Yeah. Wait. Let's see. This is, I, this is how I see it is. We want God to add all those things unto us. And then we'll seek his kingdom and his righteousness. <laughs> That's what I say. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna have, we want God to add all those things to us. Then we'll seek his kingdom and his, because we think that's what his kingdom and righteousness is. Yes. It's him, is his, him adding all that stuff to us. Yes. We think that's what a walk of faith is. That's not a walk of faith. Faith is your dwelling in tents. You're looking for a city that can't be seen. Paul says we look at the things which are what? Not seen. Not the things that are seen, because the things that are seen are what? Temporal. Including your healing. That's temporal. We want divine health. We want victory over death. That's, that's kingdom. Healing is just something that's temporal. Yeah, go ahead. Well, just what Brenda was saying, um, something that Jeremiah Johnson says is, God is not a salt and pepper shaker that adds to your life. Mm -hmm. God should be your whole life. Right. You know, and then I heard um, Bill Johnson the other day was talking about uh, the kingdom of God and righteousness seeking, and um, he said... It, a lot of times people say, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteous, like righteousness was added on. He said, no, he was just emphasizing mm -hmm. righteousness, just like what you said. That's first. It's just like where he says, tell the disciples and Peter. He, it was, he, he meant all of the disciples, right. but he was emphasizing Peter. Peter. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, see, um, <clears throat> see, that's the problem is we think the kingdom of God is him navigating our life. In, in, in the seen realm. See, so if God is directing my purchases, my healing, my health, where I live, you know, what I speak, you know, who I marry, you know, how to raise my children, are those all viable things? Yes, but that's not the kingdom of God. Those are the things that are supposed to be added unto us. See, that's where the trip up has gotten, is that we, we won't preach the righteousness and the rule of God we want to preach this, and then we call it the kingdom of God when it's about the stuff or the decisions that we make in this life. I'm, I'm, I'm all for those. I want God to direct my life. But like I said, that's the stuff that's added to me. He'll direct me what car. When, when I've bought my vehicles, I haven't struggled. Kathy will tell you. I just, I think, okay, I want a new car. And it, that's why I drop it right there. I don't go look and I, and I don't start figuring, you know, well, this car's and this car's got and this car. Well, this is this much and this is this much. See, what are you already doing? You already turned him into a navigator. I say, I need a new car. It's time to get it. I get the feeling I need a new car and then I just do go about my business. And when I bought my first pickup, the guy came in. I didn't even know it was for sale. And I walked outside. And all of a sudden, the thought came to me, that's, gonna, that's my truck. I didn't know it was for sale. I thought it was his truck. It was the car lot's truck. He was driving it. And I thought it was his truck. And I, don't, I think I asked him, I don't know if I asked him if it was for sale. I, maybe he, he might have said to me, would you like a new truck or you want to buy a truck or something. I asked him something or he said something, and I knew that was my truck. And same way with this one. I'm going through, and I'm just I'm looking at, at trucks on the Internet and everything, and all of a sudden I saw one down there at Anderson. That's it. I didn't go look at a bunch of different ones and then try to figure out. When you do that, you're already starting down a road that's going to be tough to hear God on. How many of you have ever been down that road? We've been down that road, haven't we, Kathy? 
you know. I mean, we struggled with that camper. I mean, we struggled and struggled and struggled with it. Three years. Yeah, for three years. And, and finally, finally, we agreed to it, and it, it got held up. Now, uh, is this God? No. Is this God or isn't it? It got held up, and we... Eight or nine months. Eight or nine months. And when we called and canceled it, both of us felt like a weight had lifted off of us. Now, was God holding that up so we wouldn't get it? Because you buy something like that, what if it, because I've always prayed, God, don't let us buy something that's going to kill us. I mean, physically. You know, you go buy a new car, you know, how many people buy a new car and then they get killed in it? And they never knew that when they bought it, that was the devil's plan. You know, I mean, that's sad to me. That's tragic because they're so excited about getting a new car or something. And then they get run over by a truck or something and they get killed in it. Well, you know, pulling a camper is kind of tough. I get a little bit nervous pulling something when I can't see people behind me. And uh, this is quite a bit what? Oh, Lynn and Alan lost theirs and almost lost it down in Big Canyon. And it would have pulled them down. Yeah, it would have pulled them down. Uh, yeah, yeah, a wheel came off a camper, yeah. But that's what I mean. Did God hold that up because I've prayed, don't let us buy something that will kill us, you know. And uh, some people pull campers, they pull those fifth wheels, and every time I drive by them I think, how in the world are they doing that? They can't see a thing, you know. And they're stressed about it. You know, my two friends went on a, a vacation pulling those things, and they were, they were pretty stressed out. You don't go on vacation to get stressed out. At least I don't, not supposed to, but they were, you know, pulling it through Denver and on the interstate and through a lot of traffic and rough roads and everything. So I'm just wondering because as soon as we canceled it, we both thought, ah, oh, that's a good deal. We might have was supposed to have gotten one three years before and missed it, and now we were trying to pick one on our own. So I'm not, and it's not always successful, but in the times that I've not thought about it and really need and wanted it, it's just come, and that's the way it's supposed to be. I'm supposed to be fighting for righteousness, not fighting for a new car. <laughs> I've only got a limited amount of fight. Yeah, that's a good point. yeah you've only got a limited amount of fight, or you're going to get wore out. And you need to fight for something that's going to empower you with strength. Righteousness will empower you with strength. Fighting for a decision, that's going to wear you out. You know, a car, a house, or something, that'll wear you out. Okay, anybody else? Father, we just thank you once again, again, for your word. We thank you for your faithfulness to speak to us. That's what's amazing to me is shocking. <laughs> You're shockingly good. We don't even know the extent of it. And, Father, we thank you that we will take these things to heart, not forget the type of people that we are, what we're actually fighting for, and that we are strangers and foreigners in this country, in this system, because that's what you've called us to be. We're going to live in tents. We're going to move when you say to move. And we're going to scale down when you say to scale down. We want to be edified. We want to move those things out and not take them with us in case we need them. We want to leave them behind in the wilderness, in the desert. And Father, we just thank you for who you are and the empowerment. We don't want to make you too small in our eyes. You can empower us to walk without sin. We believe you. We believe that you have the empowerment to do that. Who are we to say you can't empower us to do that? We're say if, we can, if we're saying that, we're actually saying we're God. We're bigger than you and stronger than you. You can empower us to do this. Let us fight for this. Let us fight for righteousness. And God, you add all these other things unto us because that's how good you are. Amen.